Afternoon. Um, thanks for those kind words and thanks for the invitation to come and uh, speak here. Um, before I uh, start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the territorial owners of the land on which we meet today. Uh, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, as was mentioned, I've uh, served 30 years as a police officer. Uh, I actually retired in 2012 and at midnight in the UK on the day I retired, I was actually on the beach at St Kilda. Uh, I was drinking a coffee and I did have a coat on, but I didn't tell my colleagues that. Um, as you'll see from the slide, uh, that's proof of my SITDED uh, credentials. Um, I was a designing out crime officer as well as a designing out crime officer manager. Uh, and I was responsible for the security um, involvement in the Cardiff City Football Club Stadium, which was the first sports ground uh, in the world to achieve secure by design status. Uh, a little bit of background, uh, and apologies if I go into too much detail or not enough detail. Uh, I've put four or five presentations together to give uh, a little flavour of, of what's going on in the UK. Um, and I've assumed quite a low level of knowledge because I understood that there were people from lots of different agencies here. Uh, many of you who uh, may not have been involved in problem solving before. So I'll go in, into it in a little detail. Um, as was mentioned, my boss is Chief Constable for England and Wales. Uh, the map of the UK on the left-hand side uh, clearly shows uh, parts that are missing on the map on the right-hand side. Um, people haven't mentioned Wales when they've gone through the countries. Um, Wales is uh, the... Uh, if I can... That's Wales. And the reason I say that is because I'm a proud Welsh person. And if you don't mention Wales or say, where in England is that? It's like saying to somebody from Cairns, where in Victoria are you from? So it doesn't go down too well. Um, England and Wales has 43 territorial police forces and four other police forces, including one which covers transport uh, across England and Wales. Scotland and Northern Ireland both have separate police forces and separate ministries of justice. Uh, the little police hat in the middle of the map on the right-hand side is where my boss's police uh, force is, which is South Yorkshire. The National Police Chiefs Council has got several hundred uh, areas where people lead, uh, and each of those areas is uh, looked at by a chief officer. Uh, the diagram in front of you shows one of 12 uh, coordinating committees, and this is the Coordinating Committee for Crime. If you look at crime prevention, uh, it's up there. And as you'll see, underneath it, there's, there's only one work stream. And that's because crime prevention, as you would expect, is cross-cutting, and it goes across all the areas of crime. So as a staff officer for Steve Watson, I'm regularly asked to give subject matter input uh, on crime prevention for other national leads. So in terms of what I'm going to do today, I'm briefly going to go through um, looking at what the, the, the talk is going to be about. I'm going to look at demand uh, and how we may look at reducing it to its uh, irreducible core. And that's a comment that my boss um, uses quite a lot, recognising that we're never going to stop people committing crime. What we can seek to do is to reduce it as far as possible. I'm then going to talk briefly about crime prevention in the UK and the new strategy. I'm going to look at Sarah and Pat, more of them later. The national strategy, how it came about and how we're going to look at monitoring it and seeing how people actually apply it. Problem solving a funding bid that uh, has been successful in the UK. Peer mentoring for forces uh, around their implementation of the strategy. Uh, and a little bit about, uh, about the future. So, knowing our demand, um, HMIC FRS, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabularies, Fire and Rescue Services, so it's the inspectoring, uh, inspect, inspection body that looks at both police services and fire services in England and Wales, um, has recently put some information out on demand. Uh, and it says basically that the better forces actually understand their demand, they've got staff in place to deal with it, and they actually deal with their, man, their demand based on uh, 
uh, risk assessments. Um, we do have internally generated demand and police forces are, are continually thinking about the demands that they place on themselves and whether it's actually what the public want. So I was thinking about some issues in, in Australia which perhaps don't apply to the UK and what I came up with was jaywalking patrols. So I haven't got any answers but does it make people feel fuzzy and warm if they're reported for jaywalking? What do they say to their colleagues and friends? But does it reduce accidents? And again, there was an interesting talk yesterday on behavioural science. Haven't got the answers to that, but in terms of demand, um, is that something the police service need to keep doing? It may be, it may not. I don't know where the, the evidence would lead us to. And again, another example of internal demand that we've created ourselves in the UK is something called Operation Checkpoint, where conditional cautions have been issued to people uh, who commit low-level crimes, normally for the first offence, but not only for the first offence. It might be if they're going through some sort of crisis that they will be reviewed and given a conditional caution. That becomes quite resource-intensive, and what happens is they will be peer-mentored, uh, and police officers and other key partners will work with them to try and make sure that they don't commit a crime again. So actually, we're not putting them through the criminal justice system, in some instances, we're not giving them a criminal record, and if they haven't already got one, by giving them a criminal record, it means that they've got uh, less access to things like jobs, etc. So actually, we're, we're creating our own demand by putting resources into it, but all the evidence suggests it's worth it. Um, again, another one, uh, perhaps some uh, people may need to reflect on here, or certainly we would be reflecting on it in the UK, is uh, the issue of breathalysers. So Lorraine yesterday mentioned that up to two-thirds of the work that some forces are doing in terms of Australia for breathalysers perhaps doesn't give uh, as much bang for the buck as the first third. So is that something around your resources that you might look at uh, reusing? I don't know. I don't know what the evidence uh, suggests and I don't know the strategic policy decisions for doing uh, the breathalysers that you do. I'll briefly look at skills for problem solving later. Um, but again, we need to look at risk-based analysis within how we deal with policing. So uh, when my boss, Steve Watson, took over South Yorkshire, they just got rid of uh, neighbourhood policing. And what he found was that he entered a service where they had more um, staff actually reacting than forces twice the size. And yet they still didn't have uh, a footprint in neighbourhoods. So he's looked at that and uh, certainly he's uh, readdressed that because if we haven't got people in our communities who are getting feedback on what the current threats, risks and harms are, uh, how can we effectively deal with uh, and work with those communities to make them safer? Um, <coughs> austerity in the UK. Um, I listened to the news quite uh, uh, with some interest uh, the night before last about the fact that you're having 3,000 more sworn officers in Victoria. My boss would kill for something like that, from, uh, from 15,000 to 18,000, I think you're going up. We've seen cuts in the UK of 30%, and we've gone from about 140,000 uh, uh, police officers, sworn officers, to 120. And we've had some really interesting discussions around demand in the UK, where... <laughs> We've had people at a, a city level, uh, police commanders and local authorities, looking at saying, well, we'll stop doing this, the police will have to do it. And the police are saying, well, we'll stop doing this, the local authority will have to do it. And before you know, all the people involved in the activity have gone and nobody's dealing with it. So that's certainly an issue that we, uh, we need to look at. We need to be smarter. Just as a, uh, an issue for comparison, um, uh, I did some Googling and uh, found that on average there are 202 people per police officer in Australia and 302 in England and Wales. So when you're actually looking at comparisons it would appear uh, that you have more <coughs> officers per uh, population uh, than we do. The College of Policing in the UK, if anybody, uh, and, and this presentation is available so you, you don't need to make notes if you don't want to. Um, this uh, is a feature of demand from the College of Policing and it maps out the demand that you can expect in an average sized police force in a given day. It actually looks at arrests, it looks at calls, um, 
and it looks at issues around road traffic collisions, etc. I'm not, I'm not going to go through it all, um, but if you're interested in demand and how the UK is looking at uh, measuring it, this, the, uh, the document from the College of Policing is a really useful uh, document and reference point. But we have to actually look at legislative demands, and some forces are saying we will now only do what we are legislated to do. Easy for me to say that. What legislation demands we need to do. Um, but what we also need to do is what ex what's expected from our communities. But now very much within that threat, risk and harm. So commanders within police forces, that's the first thing they do when they're looking at police operations. It's how are we dealing with our threat, risk and harm. So the public may want more bobbies on the beat. Uh, they may want their police stations open. But if we've got officers dealing with those issues, they might not be able to deal with other more serious things, such as child sexual exploitation. Um, it might be of interest to note, because I've, I've looked at the police stations as I go around at Melbourne, that in some forces, we're actually looking at closing all police stations um, during the hours of 12 o'clock till 4 o'clock. So we won't have some police station, or some forces won't have 24-hour police stations. But the best forces will look at their demand within the context of the wider public service. And again, mention was made of the Crime and Disorder Act within the UK. And actually, there's a duty there to share information for crime and disorder purposes. But it's still difficult. Many organisations, and the police are one of the worst in some areas, are quite risk averse. In others, they're taking the dare to share view. And that's becoming more a term uh, that senior managers in, in, in the police use. Um, and so we are sharing more information with our partners. Um, and we share that information on a regular basis as a matter of course. Not all forces do that. So just uh, a few, few more comparisons. Um, in the UK, violent crime um, and other crimes has been going down steadily for, for a number of years. Uh, but I've used this example of homicide, and there's, there's an, another slide coming shortly, to show it's actually increasing. So we now have to think about doing more and being smarter with reduced resources. And uh, I think probably uh, the academics are going to look at whether the reduction in policing is actually what's causing the increase in crime. And there's some, some talk that it may be, uh, but the evidence is, is, is not uh, out there yet. <coughs> Uh, and again, a comparison uh, looking at where we are. So as you'll see, uh, homicide within England and Wales and a number of other uh, jurisdictions um, has gone up considerably. Uh, you'll be happy to know that in Australia, it's actually still going down. Um, but as we say uh, in the UK, watch this space uh, and don't take your foot off the accelerator. So, so why problem solve? Um, I'll let you read that. But actually, in terms of frontline cops, sometimes we're too busy to actually look at some of the solutions that will help us. Hence, uh, no thanks, we don't need your round wheels for our cars. So, why use problem solving? Well, there's a substantial evidence base as to what works in crime prevention, and problem solving and the allied hotspot policing are the only two areas, as far as I'm aware, that um, academics will say, yes, there is clear evidence to show that as a police approach, it works. And in terms of the model that, uh, that we use, and uh, this is where I mentioned Sarah for the first time, um, a number of forces use different models in terms of problem solving. Uh, but what uh, the NPC National Police Chiefs Council have decided is that we will look at Sarah as the model uh, that we use to gather data uh, and uh, impart knowledge to forces. Um, what tends to happen is that there are a number of other uh, initiatives, uh, One Force Aven and Somerset, uh, I won't bore you with what the acronym means, but have got ID partners, and they describe it as SARA on steroids. Well, let's use SARA, let's not complicate it too much. So what is SARA? SARA uh, looks at, and I'll go into this in a little bit uh, uh, more depth in a minute, looks at scanning, analysing, responding and assessing. And what the police often do is do a little bit of scanning with police data and then respond with police staff. And we're certainly trying to move away from that and if we're going to do that we need far more information and sharing of information 
from the police to partners and from partners to the police. But it's not a linear model, so you might actually do some responses, find that it's not working, and then have to return and do some more scanning as to why it didn't work, get more data which might assist you. So one of the key issues which I mentioned through this speech is leadership. Uh, and again, there's a superintendent talking in the hall at one of the, uh, the breakout sessions yesterday uh, who said that his staff will do what he actually leads them to do. And I think that is key and crucial. And the better forces in terms of the UK doing problem solving are those where it's not just mandated by senior staff, but senior staff are shown to do it. Uh, my boss in a previous force he was in carried out a promotion process and one of the questions was, what have you as a manager done uh, to show that you can sophisticate, use sophisticated problem solving? And they could all show what their staff had done, but nobody got promoted because nobody could show evidence of what they themselves were doing in terms of sophisticated problem solving. <coughs> Excuse me. So not only do we have to have leadership, um, that create um, or encourage creativity. We have to work in partnership. We have to look at proper training, but we have to give our staff time and support to actually think about what they're doing rather than just that quick time response. Uh, and in terms of the larger problems, we need to look at suitable resources for collecting data, compiling and analyzing it, um, and working with partners to see where the gaps are. I'm not going to go into too much depth in, in terms of SARA. Um, what I will say in terms of scanning, um, quite often officers on a daily basis will attend an issue and it's dealt with. And uh, within uh, the UK, we would say, well, why are you going to do some problem solving on that? Because actually internally, they've actually solved the problem. So we're grappling at the moment with at what stage do you actually start writing things down and actually evidencing it. Uh, and I think the indications are, to start with, you need to start at a really low level to start the culture change. But as forces progress and become better at problem solving, then you can raise the bar. So perhaps an, until they've had the third or fourth incident uh, at a, a location, uh, they may not do some sophisticated problem solving. Although if on the first occasion the threat, risk and harm suggest it, they would still start something uh, at, at that time and certainly make references to, uh, to, to partners. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, part of the issue is identifying the data be, to be collected. Uh, and again, we're starting in the UK to try and look at centrally identifying where data is well used. Uh, and the Centre for Excellence on Information Sharing, uh, again, is, is a really good uh, place to go to have a look at what's working and what data is out there that we can use. Because if you don't know that data is out there, how do you know to use it? Uh, and quite often, uh, at meetings, a partner will say, well, you know, I've got some information on X, Y, or Z, uh, and actually unpacking it means that it will really assist you in, in sorting out your problems. So what we do is we start with a hypothesis uh, and then work on it to see if that hypothesis is, is correct. And as we go through, uh, it may be that we've put some responses in place and they don't work, so we have to revisit that. So again, it's, it's not a linear motion. Uh, that is not sophisticated problem solving, uh, <laughs> but I thought I'd put it on there to wake a few people up, uh, if anybody's asleep at this time. Okay, um, looking at responses, um, key issue in the UK uh, is, is plan owners. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Um, in most forces, uh, what we're finding is that uh, the plan owners tend to be at a very low level, operational level, uh, and they will be normally uh, practitioner neighbourhood policing teams, and we're moving away from that, trying to, to, to make it more sophisticated. So um, Durham uh, is, is one of the forces in the UK that has excellence whenever our inspectorate go and have a look at them, uh, and they have moved to a... Um, a situation where not only have they got PCs and PCSOs as plan owners, but actually they've also got um, chief officers as plan owners. So one example of, of that would be um, the tasking process in Durham identified that there were a number of children's homes where there were problems, uh, and chief inspectors and inspectors were dealing with them separately. So it was given to an ACC, and when she looked at it, what she realised was, was a couple of things. 
One, we, do, we weren't dealing with missing persons in the way that we were expected, so as our processes told us we should do, and neither were our partners, so that was, that was soon sorted. Um, but one of the key issues they came up with was that um, a number of children's homes had been privatised, and the uh, private homes wanted money because that's the business that they're in, and so they reduced their staff. And because they reduced their staff, and the staff were experiencing problems, and the children were, uh, were experiencing frustration because there weren't as many people to help them with their issues, um, the staff were told, well, you have to go to a lower level now, and if anybody assaults you, or looks like they're going to assault you, or they commit criminal damage, you need to call the police. So what was happening was that we've got vulnerable children who were living in their homes, because that's what a children's home is, who were being criminalised because of a change in process as a result of a private children's home trying to make some money. So we, had, uh, we have an inspectorate called the uh, Care Quality Council in the UK which looks at children's homes and they had actually given these children's homes a good. Following the intervention from the police, uh, they didn't actually close them but they nearly closed them. The result was more staff, less calls to uh, the police and a whole discussion about the fact that if you criminalise uh, vulnerable children in their home, what chance have they got of getting jobs and moving on? So the, the whole issue opened up a, another uh, thread to, that, uh, that was looked at. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about assessment because this is probably the thing that police do, do worst and what academics want uh, so much more of. Um, but again, what we're looking at doing, I'll explain later, is putting a process in place where we flag up promising things that should be assessed or things that have failed that we need assessment on. Uh, and that's uh, a key area because there's so much that we're doing in crime prevention which actually we're not sure works and some of the things actually don't work. Again, anybody asleep? Not effective problem solving? Okay. So on to, uh, on to Pat now, uh, and um, this is taken from the Pop Centre, um, a website in the UK. I'll refer to it later on. It's where I get a lot of uh, good ideas, there's a lot of good information on there. So in terms of driving the national strategy for crime prevention, this is what we're using together with, with Sara. <coughs> And basically, what the PAPT triangle suggests is that if you can break one side of this triangle, and you might have to work on more than one side, then actually you can stop crime from happening. So in terms of victims, as an example, you might want to give advice and guidance to prevent them becoming victims. In terms of offenders, you might lock them up because that's a good preventative measure, or you might persuade them why they shouldn't offend, and restorative justice uh, is, is an area where there's lots of good evidence to, to show that this will work. Um, and also, looking at, uh, at the place. Um, so what can we actually do in terms of SIPTED to reduce MOs? So for example, if on an estate all the back doors are being kicked in, what can we do to replace the back doors? But that also looks at calls for, for, for service as well. I would include that in here. So, so what can we do to reduce calls, from calls for service, which might be from people who are victims or people who are in a place where crime is going on. Um, so certainly that in terms of our demand is a key area. Um, building on that, and, and actually <clears throat> that's probably as much as we would ask cops to look at because they're, they're busy people uh, and if they've got a more intractable problem, I'll discuss how, how that might be or they uh, might be assisted with their problem. Uh, but this is where we start to think about probably the, uh, the supervisor level, uh, the sergeant, the inspector, looking at putting some more structure. And it actually opens up some, some, some more avenues. So in terms of the, uh, the target, the victim, if we look at guardians, for example, um, and we have silver surfers uh, involved in or potentially being the victims of cybercrime, what can Neighbourhood Watch do to give them information and advice and guidance? What can their children do with, with granddad or, or grandma and give them some advice on what to do with the computer because they've learned it at school? What can a postie do, perhaps about information coming through from, from foreign lands which might indicate something's going on? What might the neighbours do? Uh, but again, what can uh, the, the local, local press do as well in terms of preventing those uh, people becoming victims? In terms of handlers, if we look at child sexual exploitation, uh, what about the peers of... Um, people who are likely to, uh, to uh, offend. 
What about their parents? What about the schools? What about taxi drivers? Because again, although child sexual exploitation, a lot of it is committed by adults, young people uh, uh, also commit it. So how can we uh, work on handlers to prevent them committing, uh, committing those sorts of crimes? Uh, and, and lastly, managers. So in the park, who might assist us to prevent criminality in the park? So park, keep, park keepers, maintenance people, pla uh, planners, sports people in the park, people who walk their dogs, local businesses. And, and, and again, there was a presentation yesterday which uh, showed how local businesses can, can help. Uh, and lastly, something called super controllers, which is something from uh, Cincinnati with um, Samson and Eck. Uh, and, and this is people who don't actually deal with the incident, but can have a huge effect. So they are the police, they are the banks in terms of cybercrime, they are the internet providers in terms of cybercrime, but also local and central government in terms of legislative change that might be needed. So what works for prevention and problem solving? Well, this is something that was done uh, by Tilly and Howe in, in 98. And we've recently spent some money in the UK uh, looking at the same issues, and we've come up with the same answers. Um, so, uh, as my boss would say, reheating old truths sometimes shows us the way forward. So, just picking on some of them, chief officer involvement is key. Those forces that are doing best in terms of problem solving, the chief officer takes a personal responsibility and a personal <coughs> interest. And if that doesn't happen, it's far less likely that preventative problem solving will take place. Tasking is, is, is again a key issue. So where we're looking at dealing with car crime, burglary, CSE, cybercrime, are we actually using a problem solving methodology? And if we're not, why not? Uh, so again, those, those processes to make sure we are doing it um, are being looked at thoroughly in the UK. Um, Managers, again, their involvement um, from senior officers to managers to practitioners, if you haven't got that, that chain, often we're going to lose, lose something. Um, and this is a key issue for me, it's tactical advisors. Uh, so I'll touch briefly in a minute on uh, crime prevention officers, but we're actually moving to each force having tactical advisors that can look at providing the link between the academics and the frontline staff. So an example of where they might uh, be useful is uh, there was a burglary project in the UK which was really successful in Kirkholt. And again, if, if you want to look at it, uh, Google Kirkholt burglary project. <clears throat> really successful and it was implemented in a number of places and there was implementation failure. And the problem that we have with problem solving is that quite often if somebody tries something and they think they're problem solving and doing it effectively, it's not them that fails, it's problem solving. And what happened was Kirkhold was taken uh, to another area and a BCU commander tried, to, uh, sorry, a police commander tried to implement it. And the difference was that in the first location, the community, the frontline staff had created the project together with that police officer. In the second location, the police officer was telling everybody what to do. And uh, there were a few fingers thrown up at him and um, it didn't happen. So it's understanding um, the, the context within uh, the issues that, that, that we're dealing with. And somebody to advise, not actually do within police forces is something that we're looking at. Uh, and again, training through problem solving. Um, there's no point one force trained 600 people or frontline staff and didn't train any managers. Uh, within two years, there was very little um, obvious signs of problem solving occurring. But it's integrating it across uh, not just um, frontline, but also around uh, CID, around HR, looking at solving our problems using, using problem solving. Might not necessarily always be SARA, for those of you who are in the uh, uh, management sphere, it could be PRINCE2, but it's actually looking at making sure we do problem solving uh, as we go along. Um, an, example of, an example of that would be in South Yorkshire, um, they did some analysis and 37% of all calls being received by the call centre were from people chasing up what had previously happened. So not only the front line need to look at those repeat calls, but also the staff in the call centre needs to look at those calls. So can they give advice and guidance? Can they look at systems to, uh, to let people... Um, know what's happening 
But further than that, it's an IT solution where perhaps all frontline staff should be giving people their emails, their mobile numbers, uh, so that they can, can be contacted, contactable. Um, and now we're looking at ways, to, do you have people uh, contacting a station or a certain individual? How do you use that? <clears throat> Little bit of unsophisticated crime prevention. Anybody spot what that's... That's a, no? Designing out crime? Can anybody put an F at the end? Or well, the start of that? <coughs> a couple of faces have seen it. Here we are. If not, it's on the slides. Okay, so why a need for a crime prevention strategy? Well, crime prevention um, was the first principle of Sir Robert Peel who invented the, uh, the Metropolitan Police Force or, or was one of the co-founders. And both his first and ninth principle look at crime prevention and, and it's key to what we do. So that's, that's on the, uh, the slides. But no strategy existed um, and implementation of crime prevention was really patchy. It was seen by most cops as not something that they were that interested in. It was the, uh, the area for a crime prevention officer to, to deal with uh, and it was locks, nuts and bolts in the main. Uh, and for, for chief officers now looking at threat, risk and harm, crime prevention is all about cyber, it's about terrorism, it's about CSE, as well as those locks, nuts and bolts. So the National Police Strategy, uh, the context is um, that it works alongside two other strategies, and, and those are the what. So it's the Home Office Crime Prevention Strategy, which has six drivers of crime, which tells us what we need to look at. And locally, the chief officers and the elected police and crime commissioners develop strategies about what they think we should look at. So is burglary high in their area? Is child sexual exploitation high in their area? So that's the, uh, the what. So the police response, and uh, my boss um, asked me to put together the, the how we deal with crime prevention. Uh, and that's what the strategy we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at shortly uh, looks at. So it covers all areas of how we should carry out crime prevention, but it's not a diktat because my boss is, is just leading for crime prevention and he can't tell other chief officers what to do. But what he's done is he's put together a strategy which is, is quite easy for them to follow. So those are the key tenants. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to go through them all, but it's beyond padlocks. It's beyond alarms. And it's all about primary, secondary and tertiary crime prevention. Situational crime prevention remains a, a valid and valuable uh, area, but it's not just crime prevention. Uh, and again, as you see on the bottom, problem solving, using evidence, uh, will produce positive outcomes. So again, as this gentleman Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So over a two year period, we started to pull together a strategy and looking at the key issues, um, again, I'm not going to go through these. If anybody's interested, uh, they'll be able to go through the slides. Uh, but the main uh, key, th key theme is fewer victims, fewer offences, and less demand on policing. So my boss was the National Police Chiefs Council Lead for Crime Prevention. Um, so what he says is if, if he wasn't that and he'd just been asked to put a strategy together, there would have been far more partnership involvement in this, but he can't tell partners what to do. <coughs> Uh, and also it would have been a problem solving strategy rather than a crime prevention strategy. So some key issues there, leadership, knowledge, <coughs> partnerships. Um, and again, coming back to some of those issues later on about staff. Um, and uh, there's the strategy. So again, I'm, I'm not going to expect you to look at this in, in detail. If you're interested, you can go through. But every word on that document... <laughs> Uh, has been thought about. Is it a what? Is it a how? Is it a should? Is it a could? Is it a must? So all those things were, were, were thought about. And police forces shouldn't pick and choose any of those because uh, Steve Watson's view is if there's something that needs changing, come to him, we'll have a discussion and we'll see about changing it. Not that we will change it, but we'll certainly have that discussion. Uh, and again, police forces being police forces, um, one officer came to me and said, look, Steve, we want to add two boxes. Uh, right, OK. Um, well, we need to have that discussion. Steve Watson will, will... What are the two boxes? Well, we don't know yet, but our chief officer wants us to put two boxes so we can say it's our force strategy. 
Okay, and prevention is really on the agenda in the UK. Um, within the last couple of months, this has been uh, put forward and agreed as a National Police Chiefs Council objective for the coming year. So I'll read it out to embed a prevention process and mindset based on problem solving as a core discipline across policing. So we're not just going to play with this. Uh, we had a problem solving conference in the UK recently. There were five or six chief constables uh, who, who spoke there, the National Chief Police Council's lead, the senior home office person, senior person from Her Majesty's Inspection Constabulary and other key players. And they all wanted to come along. Uh, in fact, I was responsible for putting the speakers together and I was turning away chief officers uh, and I had two assistant chief constables who were in breakout rooms and not very happy about it, but uh, there we go. Um, also, in terms of uh, where we're going forward, we've uh, put together a transformation bid, which has been successful in gaining about uh, 8 million Australian dollars. Uh, and we're looking at a number of issues. So evaluation and research, there's, there's roughly three and a half million Australian dollars for that. And we're going to look at research around problem solving, doing some meta-analysis around uh, all sorts of different issues. Neighbourhood policing uh, is going to be key. We've reintroduced our problem solving awards, which had stopped a number of years uh, ago. Uh, and the winners of that will be going to the International Goldstein Awards, which are held every year in, uh, in America. So what else? Um, lots of websites mentioned yesterday. Um, what we're looking at doing is trying to put together a portal that we can have knowledge um, all in one place. Now it might not be uh, that it's envisaged that that uh, portal would not necessarily be the repository, but if there's good evidence of a certain issue, it would take you to that site. So if you go on to the portal uh, and the best place to uh, look at issues around breathalysers in Australia, then it would take you to the Australian website. But it's a place that police officers can go and don't have to think about, I think we saw five or six websites yesterday, I know of eight or nine, uh, and there are lots that I don't even know are out there, which would be very useful for me in my job. So it's how do we actually access that knowledge? And also we're gonna be looking at some accredited training so that people can actually get qualifications which are transferable. Um, what we're also looking is that national network of tactical advisors. So actually to create knowledge and look at evaluating on a very unsophisticated level at forces so that we can then decide if a more sophisticated evaluation is required to actually uh, add to the, uh, to the evidence base. Because what we tend to do within forces is if I want promotion, what I'm doing is working because I want promotion and so it's not going to fail. Uh, and, and Colleagues think, well, I would use that, but I'm not quite sure because he wants to be a superintendent and um, what's the evidence that actually works. So we really need to have that academic rigour about what works and what doesn't work. Anybody know what that is? <clears throat> Any clue? It's a Polish second division football club, and that's where the away supporters go. <laughs> so for those of you who are involved in SIPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, there we go. <laughs> Look out if you're going to Russia. <laughs> the World Cup starts shortly, and I think uh, Australia there. Okay, so looking at peer mentoring. Now... What we've developed in the UK is a matrix so that we can go to forces and discuss with them whether they're actually implementing the national strategy effectively. Um, there are 12 areas, and I don't expect you to read all, all this. I'll, I'll touch briefly on some of the issues. There are 12 areas, and in each of them you can get up to three points. So three, two, one, and a zero if you're not performing. I'll only touch on the, the threes here, but for those of you who want, the slides are available with, with all the different areas. So in terms of uh, leadership, um, pop ownership is key. Uh, recently at a meeting in David Powis, one of our police forces, and uh, I went with the team who were doing the mentoring, and they had a meeting with 30 senior police officers and support staff, and said, right, OK, um, we're going to go and have a meeting with 40 of your inspectors, chief inspectors and superintendents. 
who is, the, who is the strategic lead for problem solving? Have you got one? No. Can I have one? Because if I don't, if you don't give me one, I'm not going to go and talk to your 40 cops because there's no point. Right? You will have a strategic lead. Who's your tactical lead? So we went through a number of issues and unless that force had said, yes, OK, we're going to make sure that we put that in place, they weren't actually that interested in problem solving. So that's what's happening. We're going and saying, if you want to follow the strategy, we'll help you, we'll assist you, um, but you really need to look at the strategy and make sure that you're putting it, uh, putting it to practice. And you can't just pick and choose bits of it. You need to, you need to look at all of it. In terms of um, organisation uh, capability, we're actually looking at the whole issue of crime prevention officers. Um, and uh, my view and Steve Watson's view, locks, nuts and bolts and that initial burglary advice and guidance is not difficult. And in my view, it shouldn't be done by specific crime prevention officers. Um, a little bit more, and I'm sure I'll have some questions on this later. But, but my view is that if we can give our frontline staff enough information and signpost where they can go for more information on preventing crime, they are the people who need to be speaking to those in the community who are likely to be victims. Because not only can they give them advice and guidance on burglary, but what they can also give them is, is, is advice and guidance on community intelligence, what's going on in the area. But they can also get feedback from what's going on in the area. So Steve Watson uses the example of um, quite often police will be siloed, um, but we need to open our minds. So as you walk up the path to knock on a door to ask somebody about their abandoned vehicle, are you thinking about the organised crime group that live two or three doors up the street? Are you thinking about the burglar who's arrested two weeks ago who this person might have information on? When the person opens the door and you see a lady with a black eye, are you going to think about what that might mean? If you see children in the background and it's a school day, what are you going to do about that? So it's actually problem solving in everything we do and not just thinking I'm dealing with a road accident or I'm dealing with an abandoned vehicle. So those frontline staff should be giving advice to everybody they meet if they think it's warranted. So if they go into a house and it's poor security, they should be giving that advice and guidance, not uh, sending an email to somebody who may or may not be able to come out. <clears throat> Touching on the designing out crime officers, again, that's a specialist role. And there's lots of evidence that we've got from the UK uh, that where you have crime prevention officers who are also, uh, also docos and problem solving uh, advisors, you get the, uh, the jack of all trades and master of none. And actually what tends to happen is within the UK, because there's a legislative framework, we want those docos to be able to understand the legislation and have the knowledge. And I know there was a, a presentation yesterday on SIPTED where uh, docos, I think it was in New South Wales, felt they didn't have the, the information and the expertise. What we've done in the UK is we've actually shrunk the number of people who deal with designing out crime, but we're making them experts. So I previously have had to go to um, uh, planning inspection appeals, uh, gone to judicial reviews around planning and that's the level that we need to be at because if we're not able to do that and the planners know that then when they make a judgment about where they're going to actually push for changes to a development um, if they've got uh, police officers who they know aren't going to push it then actually that's the first thing that, that, that probably drops off. Tactical advisors again uh, are the key uh, and I think they need to be the link between academia and the front line. So to use the analogy of the firing range, and this is from one end of the spectrum to the other, uh, with academics, it's right, we're in the firing range, what's the data? Okay, what's the data? Okay, ready? What's the data? Uh, we need some more data. Okay, aim. There's a Campbell collaboration in place. Okay, fire. And with the police, it's ready, fire, aim. And we have to narrow that gap, and so that's why we're looking at the tactical, tactical advisors, hopefully filling that position. There's a piece of work done by um, uh, Professor Fleming at Southampton University, and she spoke to a large number of inspectors and superintendents who said, look, we're into this problem solving, we get it, but we haven't got the time to research it. What they've done in Durham, and we're using it as the, uh, the national model, 
uh, is they've got a number of key staff at the centre who will uh, look at assisting all staff to problem solve. And they should have a far better knowledge of all the websites that are out there. So if we're looking at information sharing, they should know what websites are there and how to access them. They know what new data is coming out. And they should also be able to interpret some of the graphs that the academics uh, uh, put out. So again, we had a discussion yesterday about what certain graphs mean. Um, how can we expect frontline staff to understand that? They haven't got the time to actually look at it. So how can we make that link from, from academics to the frontline staff? And again, another little bit of a bugbear of, of, of mine is that academia do really outstanding work and then it goes in academic journals. And how do we access that? But, but also, how do we uh, <laughs> distill it so that it's perhaps a, a two-page report with the key issues uh, that we can then disseminate to police officers? And if we need to, to, to pull academics in to give us more information, uh, we can do that. Um, in terms of organisational scanning, as I mentioned, we have that dare to share. Um, Durham have got rid of all their issues uh, uh, around um, uh, discipline, and they have one tenant, do the right thing. So if you're in court uh, and, and a child's been killed uh, or uh, uh, a domestic violence has occurred where somebody's been killed, what would the judge or what would those 12 jurors think if they knew what information we all had and we hadn't shared it? In the UK, we've got a little bit of legislation which allows us to share it, but even then, we're quite risk-averse. So part of what we're doing here is looking at those expert at the centre to say, look, guys and girls, you've got this information out there. You're dealing with this problem. Please use it. Speak to your partners. And if you have a problem with your partners, I know who to speak to within the council or within the partner organisation to push things forward. Uh, and again, problem ownership. It's key that we know who our problem owners are it's identified, it goes through the tasking process, and people are held to account. So actually now we're looking at when we have people joining the police service, have they actually got that problem-solving uh, mentality uh, uh, within them? Are they using it in their daily life? Um, in Cincinnati, there's a, a really useful bit of community involvement, and I know the legislation is, is different out there, and you have elected police chiefs. Um, but the community over the last five or six years with Professor Eck at Cincinnati University have held the police to account and the, the police have wanted to take their foot off the pedal in terms of problem solving and time after time the community have come back and said hey you're not looking at the victims locations and offenders and you haven't done your analysis properly so how can you expect when you're responding and you're not involving the community how can you expect it to work so that is on the slides, I'm not going to go through it, I'm not going to go through that either, uh, but for those of you who are interested, it is there. So, just briefly looking at the, um, the, the, the last six, um, partner involvement is key. We have to have partners involved, uh, and often partners will be plan owners. As well as actually being involved, they will actually own the issues. Um, we have to have key, uh, key measures and make sure that we're um, looking at it centrally and also supervisors holding people to account. Um, I'm just looking at the time thinking what I will say and what I won't say. So, yeah, it's up there. There are, are 12 issues to look at. If you want to, if you want to take the time, if you want to speak to me afterwards, those are, those are there. Just briefly, popcentre.org. This is where I go quite often for my information. Uh, there were a number of other websites mentioned yesterday, which I also use. Uh, but going back in 2004, I first came across primary, secondary and tertiary crime prevention, which is in the strategy, as a result of the first paper in this series, Crime Reduction Matters, by the Australian Institute of Criminology. And there's something about going forward, you've got the Five Eyes for Intelligence, where the English-speaking uh, uh, England, uh, UK, Canada, America, Australia and New Zealand share information on intelligence, Crime prevention the world over, 90% of it is the same. So how can we share that intelligence and not duplicate what we're doing? So lastly, a little bit of uh, unsophisticated problem solving. A car's gone in the dock. We need a crane. We didn't get a big enough crane. But don't worry. We'll get a bigger crane. And it's working. And finally... Oh dear. 
So when you're problem solving, you need to get your data, you need to get your evidence, and you need to think through what you're, uh, what you're doing. So as I take questions, I'll put that up there for people. If you can read it, you may want to reference it if you're asking questions, but um, any questions? It allows me to have a look at problems before they start. It allows me to look at my resources and partner resources and put them in the right places. It allows me to go, court and to, to, go to court and show evidence to the court of what has happened so my officers don't have to go to uh, court. So there's lots of savings there. I think coming back to the issue about academics want data, 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 and the fact that the police will come to a conference like this and we'll go to a really good speech, which might not have been looked at academically, uh, to any great rigour, it will have been looked at before it comes here, but 300 people will go away and try and implement it. So there's something around the um, evidence-based policing sits under problem solving, but don't wait until there's a huge base of evidence before you do things. Um, an academic will never uh, look at a lock uh, and say whether it's academically proven to be work, uh, proven to work, um, but it works. If we've got standards, we know it works, but that's only one um, piece of evidence that shows it works. And quite often, where we get into problems in terms of the evidence-based policing is people will say, well, just because one piece of evidence says it works, we need more. So evidence-based policing sits, for me, under problem solving. So can we please thank Steve? Please?